Good morning. My name is Ann Aiken. I'm the acting designated federal official for the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, and just before we get started, I wanted to mention that there are a few things you should know. Um, this is a federal advisory council, council, and it's governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA for short. FACA provides rules about the circumstances by which agencies or officers of the federal government can establish or control committees or groups like this one to obtain advice or recommendations. The voting members are special government employees and therefore are subject to conflict of interest laws and regulations, as are all the, the members who work for the federal government. These members previously provided information about their personal, professional, and financial interests. Each voting member's financial interest and outside affiliation has been carefully screened each year to ensure that they comply with the federal ethics law. The liaison representatives are non-voting members of the advisory council and are not subject to the same FACA rules as the voting members. Additionally, the information provided at this meeting does not necessarily represent the official position of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mentions of products, processes, services, manufacturers, companies, or trademarks does not constitute its endorsement or recommendation by the U.S. government, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bob Hopkins, the chair of the committee. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's second day of our September 2023 INVAC meeting. I want to thank Ann and the whole INVAC team uh, once again for their help in planning this meeting and supporting the committee throughout the year, including all the support for our two subcommittees. I also want to thank INVAC members and the subcommittee members for their work and support throughout this, uh, this last couple of years uh, and their dedication to achieving our goals of improving the health of Americans and those beyond our shores. I look forward to today's presentations and discussions. I want to begin with a few housekeeping items and then we'll move on to a high level overview of yesterday's meeting and today's agenda. In terms of housekeeping, I want to remind everyone this is a public meeting. It's being webcasted on the HHS website. We have sign language interpreters available on the HHS live stream. I would encourage you to speak slowly and clearly to assist them in doing their work as effectively as possible. Our interpreters help to make this meeting more accessible. And I also want to let them know how much I and we appreciate their work. For our virtual participants, please remember to mute yourself when not speaking, and please don't use your camera unless you're presenting, asking questions, or answering a question. During discussion, I ask that all members and speakers, both virtual and in person, identify themselves before speaking if I didn't acknowledge you by name and giving you the floor. This gives the note taker and others uh, an easier time following along. Throughout the day, there will be opportunities for committee discussion. If you'd like to ask a question or provide a comment, please raise your tent card in the room or send me a message uh, through the chat feature for virtual attendees. As always, members of the public can provide a comment by phone at 2.15 p.m. today. Public comments are not a question and answer session. They represent an opportunity for those who want to make a comment or a statement to do so. The deadline to request space for public comment for this meeting has passed. However, anyone can submit a written comment up to three pages in length to NVAC at HHS.gov. Yesterday, we started our meeting with a discussion, vote, and approval of the Vaccine Safety Subcommittee report. I'm confident the report will help HHS and the Assistant Secretary to continue to support and further develop collaborations to assure that vaccines which are used are as safe as they are effective in preserving healthy lives for people in the U.S. and beyond. I very much look forward to the publication of this important report in public health reports in the near future. We next heard two important presentations reviewing assessments of the safety of routine childhood vaccinations and the COVID-19 vaccines in children from six months to 12 years. Our federal agency and liaison members provided vaccine-related updates since our last meeting, and after lunch, we heard from experts from AIM and NFID discussing recent collaborations to facilitate effective practices and communication to immunize and protect people from severe COVID, influenza, and RSV illness by effective immunization. We heard a brief update from the Innovation and Immunization Subcommittee, followed by a discussion to facilitate the committee's efforts to complete its work. 
We look forward to ongoing review of their progress at future NVAC meetings. We had a fascinating panel on the ways vaccination can help to counter the negative health effects from climate change, including information on climate effects on epidemiology and some early phase research with the potential to help people from vector-borne diseases like Zika and Leishmaniasis. We heard a fascinating panel discussing some of the robust research activity around adjuvants and their potential to help our vaccination efforts as they spur immune response. And we closed the day with public comment. Today, we'll open with a panel on inclusion and immunization. After a brief break, we will turn to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, talking about sustainable vaccine ecosystem. And just before lunch, we'll hear about several vaccines in development. After lunch, we'll hear from a panel on respiratory illness prevention. And our final presentation for the day will be an update on the meningococcal disease type Y outbreak in Virginia. And again, the day will conclude with public comments. Finally, as a reminder, please hold the 2024 meeting dates on your calendar. February 22nd, 23rd is planned as a virtual meeting. June 13th, 14th, and September 12th, 13th, hopefully will be live meetings uh, next year. Please refer to the NVAC website for final details on these upcoming meetings. At this time, I'd like to invite the members of our first panel who will be presenting from the stage to, to come forward. Our first panel for the day is inclusion and immunization. Uh, addressing abilities in all of our efforts. More than one in four adults in the United States has some type of disability. Although the term people with disabilities sometimes refers to a single population, this is a diverse group of people with a wide range of needs and abilities, such as people with autism or Down syndrome, people with physical disabilities who receive personal care services at home, and people who are receiving behavioral health treatment in residential facilities. Disabilities may include difficulty with walking or climbing stairs, hearing, seeing, or concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. Neurodiverse people have lower childhood immunization rates than their peers without autism, leaving them vulnerable to many vaccine-preventable diseases. Vaccines prevent disabilities and diseases which may adversely affect people with a disability, including people with disabilities in our everyday activities and encouraging them to have roles similar to their peers who don't have a disability is a disability inclusion. This involves more than simply encouraging people. It requires making sure that adequate policies and practices are in effect in a community or organization. Although vaccination is important, many people with disabilities and older adults have difficulty finding information about their eligibility and where to go for a vaccine, scheduling appointments, or obtaining reliable and accessible transportation. In this session, we'll learn about ways to better include people with disabilities across our vaccination efforts. Our speakers today are Dr. Bonalyn Swainer from the Johns Hopkins Disability Research Center, Stephanie Mucha and Danielle Hall from the Autism Society, Edmund Walker from the Administration for Community Living, Sarah Maloney from US Aging, and Mary Beth Musemechi from George Washington University. And I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Swainer to the podium, and she will start us off. All right. Thank you so much. I'm Bonnie Swainer. Thank you, first of all, for including this conversation as part of your, your meeting and discussions. Um, so today I'm going to talk about improving vaccine equity for people with disabilities lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. So I only have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna get right into it and start by talking about the drivers of COVID-19 vaccine inequities for people with disabilities. And largely, I'm gonna talk about four. First is the biased views of disability in our society. Second is inaccessibility, as was mentioned uh, just now. Third is limited data on disability. And fourth is lack of community engagement from people with disabilities. So let's start with views of disability. So one in four, again, as was just described, American adults has a disability. 67 million people, those are the latest estimates, um, actually from my center. What that means is that people with disabilities are common. People with disabilities are the largest minority group in the United States and around the world, which also means that people with disabilities are part of every single one of our communities. 
It also means the ways that we talk about disability, ways that we include or exclude people with disabilities matters for a significant portion of our population. But views of disability which are antiquated, quite frankly, stigmatizing and biased still prevail, are really pervasive. And that became uh, really clear during COVID-19. It's also important to understand that when we think about health, there really is a hierarchy to that idea. And that hierarchy is underpinned by an idea that disability is at the bottom of that pile, right? That people with disabilities have lower value at that lower scale of health. And again, that came to light during COVID-19 when we were talking about allocation of resources and when we were talking about COVID-19 vaccines. So what I'm showing on this slide are headlines from a few articles really elevating that issue, where people with disabilities at the initial rollout of COVID-19 vaccines were at the bottom of the pile in certain instances. And people from the community felt that they were incorrectly uh, excluded from prioritization. They were high risk and not prioritized. So at my center, um, we had an amazing at the time undergraduate, Sabrina Epstein, who had noticed that her grandfather in a different state would have been um, higher in, in getting an opportunity for receiving COVID-19 vaccine, but lived in a state where it was not available. So acknowledging this inequity, we decided to do something and started to collect data. We propped up the COVID-19 vaccine dashboard for people with disabilities, not to be confused with the Johns Hopkins COVID-19 <laughs> dashboard that got much attention. Um, we got support from the American Association of People with Disabilities to do this work. And what we did is we collected data from state health department websites um, across all 50 states, DC, and five US territories. We updated this information weekly, looking at the prioritization of vaccines for people with disabilities. We made the results publicly available on a dashboard and importantly, in accessible formats. We looked at four categories that would impact or cover people with disabilities. People in long-term care settings, such as in nursing homes, people who are living in other congregate care settings, people with chronic conditions, which fall under the umbrella of the disability community, and people from other disability-related groups, which included people receiving direct support care in the community, people with intellectual developmental disabilities, there was data showing the high risk in that group, and recipients of certain Medicaid programs, which would indicate that people had disabilities. So what we did is we published this data on our dashboard. What I'm showing on this slide is an example, a snapshot from that dashboard for each state showing of those groups who was available for vaccine. We then compared and contrasted that data in multiple formats. We showed on state maps, as I'm showing here, and we showed the percentage of states where those group, people from those groups would be available for vaccine in bar graphs. We used alternative text to make it available for people who use screen readers. We also, uh, during the time of working on this project, heard from the community and there was an increasing focus on the inaccessibility of vaccine websites, um, vaccine information websites uh, for COVID-19. This also became front page news. I'm showing two headlines of articles about blind Americans and people with low vision who could not register vaccines because they were not in accessible formats. I will disclose I'm actually a person that has a visual disability. This impacted me as well, right? So this became personal, admittedly. So we propped up a second dashboard where we worked with our colleagues um, at a company called WebAIM to assess the accessibility of all state vaccine registration websites and information sites. We then rank ordered those scores of how accessible they were, updating each week. Similarly to our prioritization uh, dashboard, we showed the data of the most to least accessible across states uh, using map formats and alternative text formats so people's screen readers could get this information. In the end, what we found is very stark place-based inequities 
and COVID-19 vaccine for people with disabilities. So what I mean, depending on where you live, you may have been prioritized or not for vaccine. You may have been able to register or not, depending on who you are and where you lived. When we think about place-based inequities, we don't often think about people with disabilities, but that actually is something perhaps we should change. As a result of these conversations of inequities of COVID-19, the Department of Justice took some action. It wasn't these inaccessibilities was not just happening at state levels, but more local levels. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, businesses, state and local governments cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. That includes ensuring effective communication, such as websites for people with disabilities. The Department of Justice settled with multiple grocery store chains and pharmacies that did not have accessible vaccine registration websites for COVID-19. As a result, those um, grocery stores and pharmacies had to make their COVID-19 vaccine websites accessible to meet accessibility standards and undergo regular accessibility testing. It was a good win for the disability community. Relatedly, and in part uh, motivated by that, although this work was long time coming, the Department of Justice recently put out rulemaking to strengthen Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which focuses on state and local governments, to establish more specific requirements, including the adoption of specific technical standards for making accessible services, programs, and activities offered by states and local government entities to the public through web and mobile apps. This would have been helpful during COVID-19. Further, recently, HHS Secretary Becerra announced rulemaking to tighten 504 regulations. So Section 504 under the Rehabilitation Act um, is, is a really uh, important uh, 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 part of our, our law to protect people with disabilities from discrimination. So this tightening, proposed tightening of the 504 regulations is entitled non-discrimination on the basis of disability in programs or activities receiving federal finance assistance. This was very recently released. And in this release, Alison Barcroft, who's the dir acting director of the Administration for Community Living, which my colleague uh, is, is representing, stated, the COVID-19 pandemic shone a spotlight on the discrimination that too many people with disabilities continue to face. The denial of medical treatment due to ableism, inaccessibility of medical equipment to, and websites, to having no choice but to receive services in institutional settings. So the impact of what happened in COVID-19 has reverberated in lots of ways across policy. But in addition, there remains limitations in disability data that we still are feeling today. So my center, we say, who counts depends on who is counted. And we do not currently collect disability data as a core demographic variable, like we collect race, ethnicity, age, gender identity. People with disabilities, there is a movement to do that. And because we don't do that, we still are unable to track COVID-19 outcomes, vaccination rates, um, testing, and that's not just for COVID-19, it's for all vaccines and really for just about any outcome. And that's a problem when we're thinking about the biggest minority group in the United States and one that's highly intersectional. And that's just what I'm showing on this slide. There is some change. So uh, in July of 2022, um, the USCDI, the um, um, Office of the National Coordinator on Health Information Technology, um, pushed forward some recommendations to include disability data as a demographic variable in all electronic health records. Um, my colleagues and I spoke at a meeting that led to those recommendations. Megan Morris at the University of Colorado and Sylvia Yi from DREDF, the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund. And we've written about this issue of the need to standardize disability data collection as a demographic variable in electronic health records to be able to do exactly what I just described, fill that gap, to be able to track vaccine uptake outcomes, but really it would do so much more. So those recommendations are now um, at OMB for consideration. 
and we will see, <laughs> but we are hopeful. That would be an important change. So the last point I wanna make that was a driver of COVID-19 vaccine uh, inequities was the lack of community engagement for people with disabilities. So in the work that my center did and the work that we still continue to do, it is astounding at the limited connections that state, local governments, and even many federal agencies have with the disability community. So when emergencies like COVID-19 come up, there's no bridges that have been formed, no meaningful connections to the disability community. I also say that people with disabilities are not um, considered a health disparity population, which eliminates us from lots of opportunities to build those bridges. And that's important because when we're thinking about how to build a more inclusive society, a more inclusive system for um, um, advancing equity for vaccines and other things, we gotta start at the start. Which means we need to include people with disabilities in the initial design, in the initial thought process. They need to be at the table where decisions are being made. Lastly, I just wanna end with saying that vaccine inequities for people with disabilities go far beyond COVID-19. That's what I'm talking today about, but want you to think beyond the pandemic. What I'm showing on this slide is data from an amazing faculty member at my center, uh, Franz Castro, who has documented um, influenza vaccine inequities for people with disabilities. So from 2016 to 2021, the annual age standardized prevalence of influenza vaccine was consistently lower in adults, American adults with disabilities as compared to those without. Although there was overall a trend for increase in vaccine, influenza vaccine uptake over that time, the percent change was lower in people with disabilities, 11 versus 18%. It's also important to think about intersectionality. So among disabled adults, Asian adults had the largest percent increase, but black non Hispanic adults with disabilities had the lowest. So I just wanna end with saying the take home points. When you're thinking about improving vaccine equity, please consider advancing the collection of disability data that needs to be a priority. It also needs to be a priority to focus on accessibility, the start. There's a saying, it's not, the, it's not a, uh, a step at the end, it's the step you missed. And it's critical to include people with disabilities at all steps of the process. And certainly last but not least, don't wait to take action. I know for many folks, this is new area. Lots of times when I speak to groups, there's some level of discomfort. And I appreciate that. But out, do outreach, work with groups doing this work, people on this panel, but don't wait to do it. If you wanna learn more about my, my center, uh, you can go to disabilityhealth.jhu.edu. I have my email address. Uh, we have a podcast that talks a lot about uh, COVID-19 and the impact on people with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next presenters are Stephanie Mucha and Danielle Hall from the Autism Society. Uh, Danielle, I, think I see you on the screen and your slides are up. You have the floor. Good morning and thank you for having us today. My name is Danielle Hall and I am with the Autism Society of America. Before we start, I just want to say thank you so much for including us in this important conversation today. Next. The Autism Society of America thanks our partner, U.S. Aging, for their continued support and participation in the Aging and Disability Vaccination Collaborative. Next. Before we begin discussing accessible vaccinations, it's important to have a good understanding of who we are and why the Autism Society is charting this type of work. The Autism Society is the largest and oldest grassroots organization serving the autism community since 1965. It is our mission to create connections, empowering everyone in the autism community with the resources they need to live fully. Our vision is to create a world where everyone in the autism community is connected to the support they need when they need it. Next. With one in 36 children receiving an autism diagnosis, co-occurring medical and mental health conditions, and premature mortality rates, it's critical that we prioritize health equity in the autism and disability community. 
In addition to known social determinants of health, the autism community faces unique barriers to accessible healthcare, stemming from sensory, social, cognitive, and communication differences. Next. We developed the Vaccine Education Initiative, or the VEI for short, to provide education, inspire confidence, and create accessibility. This model, which was developed for the autism community, can benefit all populations. The VEI supports healthcare professionals, patients, family and caregivers to eliminate those traumatic practices and rewrite the vaccine experience. Next. As spoken today on the panel, accessibility is critical for vaccine uptake, especially in the autism and disability community across the lifespan. Through our work over the past two years, we have identified high impact strategies to increase accessibility for all with a focus on aging, BIPOC, Hispanic, LGBTQIA+, and rural populations with autism and other disabilities. Next. We designed this interactive guide to accessible vaccine clinics. Our guide can be found on our website and is also available in Spanish. Our guide gives tips and tools that help transform vaccinations and other healthcare experiences, including appointment preparation and environmental planning and key resources for communication and sensory supports, injection tool options and additional strategies. As we all know, there are a number of barriers to accessibility that occur before anyone steps into a vaccine clinic. The standard vaccine registration and preparation process can be modified to increase accessibility, reduce stress, and improve outcomes. The registration process is an excellent way to gather information needed to support a successful experience. Beyond the typical registration questions, we individualize information. We ask about past vaccine experiences and information about any support the person receiving the vaccine may find helpful. To break down language and literacy barriers, we offer visual samples of strategies. We ask about social communication preferences, recognizing that some benefit from social conversation as a, as a distractor and that for others, any social demand is anxiety producing. Instead of saying, how's your day? We can equip providers with a patient's favorite subject or passion, reducing what is awkward for some and anxiety producing for others. While the typical vaccine appointment lasts 15 minutes or less, what many providers may not realize is that patients and their family members and caregivers often spend days or even weeks preparing for that 15 minutes. Much of our work to increase accessibility was to help patients and their family and caregivers with that preparation. This information helps us ensure that we are best prepared on the day of the clinic. I'm now gonna pass it over to my colleague, Stephanie Mucha, to discuss ways our vaccine education initiative creates accessibility and inclusivity. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you to the panel and everyone for inviting the Autism Society today. Next slide, please. We found that when provided before the vaccine appointment, social stories and visual schedules, like the ones you see here, create access to information about the appointment and reduce anxiety by foreshadowing the process of receiving a vaccine. By creating predictability and structure to an otherwise stressful and chaotic experience, we can reduce anxiety for patients their family and caregivers, and the healthcare professionals. It's important to note that while social stories are an evidence-based practice for supporting those with autism, they can also support vaccine recipients without autism. Next slide, please. There's a wide range of communication differences in our community, and too often those who communicate non-verbally are left out of the healthcare conversations. Access to communication is central to closing that health equity gap. The communication board you see here is a helpful tool. It uses symbols on the front and a letter board on the back to allow for nonverbal communication. Tools such as these are made available at all Autism Society accessible vaccine clinics. Next slide, please. 
Designing sensory accessible environments can mean different things for different people. And, but we'd like to share some examples of simple strategies that we've used that can be applied in most settings where vaccines will be administered. Reducing fluorescent lighting. Does anybody like fluorescent lighting? Offering a variety of seating options. Providing noise canceling or reducing headphones. Offering distractors like sensory and fidget tools. Providing visual supports and reducing crowded areas. Next. During our vaccine events, we took note of high impact tools and resources that made a difference for our participants, and we designed accessible vaccine kits. In addition to our communication board, visual schedules, and social stories that you've already seen, our kits include sensory tools like sunglasses, fidget spinners, noise reducing headphones, stickers, and pain deferring injection tools like a shot blocker, which is that yellow object you see on your screen. These tools, this model, they are helping to rewrite the vaccine experience, and we've seen how it's reducing traumatic vaccination for many populations. Next slide. We'd like to share some positive strategies. Um, lengthening the appointment time. A little extra time goes a long way for someone who's very anxious. Offering relational support, focusing on high interest or passion areas. Someone walks in with a Chicago Bears shirt, talk to them about the Bears. Maybe that will calm them down. Um, learning from caregivers and individuals about their needs. Take a little time to know your patient and know what they need. Facilitating choice and autonomy. What snack would you like? What fidget do you want to play with? What color Band-Aid do you want? In general, keep in mind the three Ps, predictability, patience, and positive reinforcement. Next slide. When we started to implement our accessible vaccination model, we first wanted to ask the community about their past vaccine experiences. We heard the following. He doesn't like the medical office setting. He doesn't like unfamiliar people to touch him. They hate shots. They haven't gotten any vaccinations in years. I have extreme anxiety and a fear of vaccines. He will cry and scream and say he's being tortured. We have never been given any other option. So all we've ever done when he received vaccinations is to hold him down while he cries and resists. She has never had a positive experience with shots and has always needed to be restrained. We will do anything you think will help. Next slide, please. And this is some of the feedback we received after implementing our accessible vaccination models. They were completely comfortable and calm through what is usually and typically a stressful situation. She was so well respected by the staff and volunteers. Today helped her move past her fears and actually have a positive vaccine experience. There was no anxiety about getting the second shot because of how smoothly the first one went. This clinic was a game changer for my family. Getting this done in a low stress, guilt-free environment, it alleviated my own stress as a parent, always worrying about being judged for my child's behavior. The different tools available to distract my son made him comfortable and relax. Nobody had to hold him down. Next slide. And perhaps the most powerful and promising was the feedback that we received from our dedicated healthcare professionals. These are the folks that we asked to help us implement this new model of vaccine delivery. We got comments like, I've worked in pediatrics for 25 years and I have never seen anything like this. There's no reason we couldn't do this in every clinic. We can. At this point, I'd like to start our brief video we have seen how powerful, how important, and how successful the Autism Society's accessible vaccine clinics can be. This PSA was created at one of our earlier clinics, which was pediatric focused, but we have since expanded our model to welcome all communities, including our disability and aging populations. This PSA highlights some of the special moments and really underscores the impact we can have when we all work together. You could play, please. Mm -hmm. 
The ongoing impact of COVID-19 is felt by us all. People with autism are more likely to experience severe symptoms and complex barriers to health care. Individuals with intellectual disabilities are also six times more likely to die from this disease. We see you. We understand the unique challenges the autism community faces. The Autism Society is committed to vaccine education, confidence, and access through our vaccine education initiative. Together, we are reimagining the vaccine experience. We prepare, educate, move, respond, and support. I got my vaccine today, and I didn't hurt. Visual schedules and social stories prepare vaccine recipients. Today at the vaccine clinic, it was my first experience using social stories, communication boards, and visual supports to help ease the children's anxiety and help prepare them to receive the vaccines that they needed. Healthcare providers receive training to facilitate a supported experience. Because of this, our vaccine clinics have a 99% success rate. This was a successful vaccine experience because of the healthcare providers here, the play therapists, the accessory support used for the injection sites, being in their own environment. It made it very welcoming and comforting. Another great thing we've been able to do with the clinics is offer parents the option to do a drive-in so they don't even have to come out of their car. We can just pull in, they call us. Our public health workers have been amazing and just gone out. We've talked to the parents, done everything, gotten the shot, and they're done in minutes. Because of the strength of our affiliate network, we have hosted over 50 educational events and 30 vaccine clinics across the country. Because of you, we continue to advocate for a more inclusive, supported healthcare system. I could not ask for a better experience. It's for all, it's for all people. All kids can benefit from this. The toys, to the stickers, to the snack bags, to even the shop blocker made a huge difference in, in making the experience of getting a vaccine so much more calm and a positive experience. It made me feel a lot more like I was at a friend's house rather than getting a shot. I wish I could get all my vaccines moving forward like I did today. The Autism Society of America is charting a path to improve health equity to ensure that the autism community and their families have both the access and the opportunity to obtain full health potential. Together, we can be the connection. The Autism Society. The connection is you. Get connected at autismsociety.org. Thank you so much. Um, next slide. In closing, thank you again for this opportunity. If you would like any further information um, about our program or any of the programs of Autism Society of America, please reach out to us um, at vei at autism-society.org. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Our next presenter is uh, Edwin Walker from the Administration for Community Living. Mr. Walker, your slides are up. You have the floor. Good morning. And uh, thank you for the invitation to present the strategies we've used to enhance immunization access and awareness. And I, I have to start by thanking Stephanie and Danielle, and the subsequent speaker to me, Sarah, because they're part of our collaborative and part of the initiatives that we've made. But I'm Edwin Walker. Uh, I'm with the U.S. Administration for Community Living, which is an operating division here in the Department of Health and Human Services and a sister agency to the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, who you advise. And um, we focus on enhancing the health and well-being of older adults and people with disabilities and enabling them to live independently in their own homes and communities and to fully participate in community life. Our populations are, are particularly vulnerable to severe health consequences resulting from infectious diseases and, and so it's critically important that we, we are aligned and work cooperatively 
on strategies to not only provide access to vaccines, but to educate and convince the hesitant and the uninformed to actually go get their vaccinations. Uh, and while typically on an annual basis, we host an array of fall influenza vaccine clinics, we learned during the COVID pandemic um, that our traditional strategies and methods were really inadequate to address the needs of our populations. So I'd like to share with you today some of the lessons we learned uh, that we believe should be embedded in future strategies for enhancing immunization access. We were able to launch two separate initiatives to address these issues with our populations. The first was our general vaccine access initiative with the support of CDC and outreach to non-traditional partners. This was initiated because of the high rate of serious illness and even death among our populations and the fact that we had a national network of community-based organizations who provide on an ongoing basis the social determinants of health to achieve our mission. Uh, this was designed to provide specific targeted outreach because of the at the height of COVID, we knew that mass vaccination clinics with long lines and wait times didn't provide adequate access for our populations. We needed individualized and person-centered approaches like providing assisted transportation to clinics and providing, providing priority access to bypass the lines. And, and for those who couldn't leave their homes, even with assistance, we needed to provide in-home vaccinations. Initially, it seemed like um, that the difficulty with access and the seeming politically motivated resistance were the key reasons for people not accessing vaccinations. And, uh, but we learned that there was so much more. Uh, we realized that we were dealing with segments of the population with deep-rooted distrust of the public health system, and part of our population had vivid personal memories of both the Tuskegee experiment and the initial rollout of the polio vaccine. They had these lived experiences and we had to overcome those. We, live, we learned that in order to make a difference, we needed to use trusted community-based organizations and individuals within the local community and from each local culture within the community. And this included faith-based leaders and first responders as supplements to our, our, our community-based organizations. The second initiative was a vaccine uptake initiative. Uh, it was a special initiative launched by the White House designed to really drill down and target immunizing even more older adults and people with disabilities and to build and leverage partnerships with local community and faith-based organizations to reach those populations. It was really focused on equity, achieving greater degrees of equity and those most at risk. So initially, we received $100 million from CDC for our first initiative to provide access to information, services, and support for getting COVID vaccines. To assist, we established a Disability Information and Access Line, or DIAL, to provide assistance to people with disabilities, and uh, we enhanced our existing elder care locator that assists people uh, older people and families seeking assistance. And these two information lines connected folks with resources, test kits, and how to find on the ground providers. We were um, quite inclusive <laughs> of uh, all components of our aging and disability networks because each has the ability to reach the wide diversity that exists in our populations. And as you might be able to see on this slide, it included everybody, state and area agencies on aging, centers for independent living, university centers for excellence in developmental disabilities, protection and advocacy systems, councils on developmental disabilities, and our aging and disability resource centers. Our second initiative, the development of an aging and disability vaccine collaborative, which 
which uh, Danielle mentioned first, was initiated by the White House to rapidly get funding to local community-based organizations like senior centers, faith-based organizations, and other aging and disability organizations. It focused on both COVID and influenza by hosting clinics and providing in-home vaccinations. But also we learned that we were dealing with populations with incredibly great needs. So we needed to address their health and social service needs before they would even begin to think about getting a vaccination. As mentioned, we focused on equity. And this slide depicts our target populations. Danielle mentioned some of them that, um, you know, these are the folks that were at highest risk and are the hardest to reach. They are, they have, um, historically been underserved, and they face additional barriers in accessing vaccines. And they're listed on the slide there. We targeted the counties with low rates of vaccine uptake by analyzing the data from CDC, and we learned that it takes multiple touches, contacts, or encounters to build trust before people are ready to get a vaccine. With both initiatives, our initial outreach was directed to our traditional networks and partners, and, and we continue to expand to a number of new, but I would say logical, non-traditional partners. So that ranged in working with Meals on Wheels to community pharmacies and local public health departments to include first responders. But then we continued to drill down, and we realized we needed to go well beyond our expected or logical non-traditional partners and encountered some really, I would call them truly non-traditional partners like wrestling associations and, and those addressing the homeless populations. And I believe Sarah, who's going to follow me, she works with age, uh, U.S. Aging and is one of our primary grantees on this. She'll tell you a little more about some of the experiences they encountered. So our lessons learned that I'd like to really share with you uh, as you consider approaches for reaching the hardest to reach populations for future immunization efforts of any kind include multiple contacts are needed. We are dealing with hesitant and socially isolated individuals, so we must go and meet them wherever they are. We can't assume that folks are just going to come and get a vaccination uh, they're going to go to a vaccination clinic. It's going to be accessible. Um, and even in, as late as we are in the game, after providing lots of information and lots of education, 17 to 20 percent of the folks we are addressing are receiving their first vaccination of any kind. And, and bear in mind, we've been pushing, <laughs> we've been pushing updated vaccines, and we're finding, gosh, these people haven't gotten anything. And so it's critically important, and I can't stress enough, it takes seven to eight contacts to get them to the point where they're ready to take their first vaccine. And even for those who have gotten some type of vaccine before, uh, even to get that updated vaccine, it takes multiple contacts again. Second uh, is supportive services and assistance must be provided to meet the predominant needs that these individuals have whether it's transportation or rental and housing assistance or utility assistance, whether they need food assistance like SNAP or food stamps, um, whether they need access to health care. We have to provide those things first. And, and third is our outreach must be conducted by trusted community networks and individuals who really reflect the culture that we're attempting to reach. And, and they must have the ability to provide these needed supportive services. You just can't give them information about it because they're not going to act. They have to be able to actually authorize and provide those services. In terms of messaging, we learn that it has to be ongoing and targeted and that it must be localized and delivered by the community-based organizations from within each community. In addition, a broad array of communication mechanisms must be used. We can't just put it on our website and think we're done. That's simply not enough. So last, we, we learned the importance of keeping the message very, very simple. 
while we clearly understand our tendency and our need to be scientific and to be technical and to be legally on point, that type of messaging just doesn't work for the populations we're trying to reach. So I want to thank you again for the opportunity to share our experience with you. And I look forward to hearing the remaining panel members and the opportunity to address questions and engage in a dialogue. So last, I must say, I thank you. Thank you for the advice and the guidance that you provide to us in order to um, address the critical life-enhancing and life-saving immunizations that we all want to provide. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. Our next presenter is Sarah Maloney from USAG. Sarah, I see you on the screen and your slides are up. Thank you. Hello. Thank you to the panel for allowing me to speak today and for my colleagues with the Autism Society and Administration for Community Living for setting me up for my portion of the panel. I'm Sarah Maloney, and I'm the Program Director for the Aging and Disability Vaccination Collaborative with U.S. Aging, and that is one part of the ACL Vaccine Uptake Initiative grant. I'd like to share with you today about the work that is being done using trusted messengers to empower older adults and people with disabilities to make educated decisions about their health. Next slide. To start, let me share who is part of the collaborative. We have 148 grantees that extend into a network of over 1,600 organizations providing support to encourage vaccine uptake. Among those organizations are Area Agencies on Aging, Title VI Native American Aging Programs, Centers for Independent Living, Aging and Disability Resource Centers, No Wrong Door Systems, and other community-based organizations serving primarily older adults and or people with disabilities. These organizations are already trusted voices in their communities and generally provide a multitude of needed services for these populations. Excuse me. They are partnering with other community organizations along with public health departments, federally qualified health centers, consultant pharmacists, local and chain pharmacies, and organizations with mobile vaccine clinics if they don't already have one themselves. We also have 21 national partners that span across the aging and disability space and enable us to reach different ethnic and cultural populations. They provide strategic guidance and support for U.S. aging along with grantees and their partners. We provide a lot of technical assistance, troubleshooting, and hands-on support with our grantees by providing webinars on relevant topics, providing weekly office hours, and doing monthly check-ins to ensure they have the support they need to fulfill their goals. Um, we have great coverage across the United States. This map also includes grantees from the National Council on Aging who received the second part of the Vaccine Uptake Initiative grant. We work closely together to ensure our grantees are maximizing resources and working together when the need arises. You may be wondering, how can I find one of these grantees? We just launched a searchable web page to connect consumers to their local vaccine uptake initiative grantee, which includes U.S. Aging and uh, National Council on Aging. Uh, I apologize, I don't have the, uh, the actual site on there. We just launched it yesterday, um, but it's yougotthis.usaging.org to locate your nearest vaccine uptake initiative funded organization. Marketing efforts are currently underway to bring traffic to the site and help people locate their nearest site. For areas that do not have coverage, they will be directed to the elder care locator or dial, as Edwin mentioned, the Disability Information and Access Line to connect to the best resource for vaccines in their area. So our grant focuses on increasing vaccine uptake among older adults, thank you, next slide, <laughs> and people with disabilities for influenza and COVID-19 vaccines. Most sites are offering additional vaccines to meet the needs of those they are serving, including shingles and pneumococcal. The services provided fit into three categories, vaccinations offered through community events or in-home vaccinations, supportive services, including assistance with signing up for an appointment or transportation to an event or even a doctor's office if needed, and then education on the importance of vaccinations, along with the most updated information and outreach to encourage individuals to attend these events or sites. Next slide. 
Our grantees are reaching subsections of older adults and people with disabilities as well. This is a list of specific areas our grantees are focused on, bringing trusted messengers to bring education and then offer an opportunity for getting a vaccination. So, um, you know, very marginalized, underserved populations that we are reaching out to inside of the older adult and um, people with disabilities uh, populations. Next slide. So the community clinics that are being held range broadly in size and type of activity. Larger, larger events include the National Grange Big E Multi-State Fair in New England that brings 1.6 million members annually, whose median age is over 55. These members are from all over the U.S. and focus on animal husbandry. Smaller events have included karaoke or Tai Chi to enc encourage social engagement and fun. Creative grantees have started holding computer classes that teach individuals how to use the internet and uh, by searching online, walking them through accessing the CDC website and reading information on vaccines, and then conveniently holding a clinic after the class. Pharmacists and trusted messenger messengers are then there to answer questions, and it gives them an opportunity to get vaccinated and check that off their list of things to do. Cultural events are also garner larger crowds and encourage social connection while also connecting marginalized populations to other resources such as transportation, nutrition programs, and in-home support. An example is a pop-up clinic held in Minnesota at the Han Characters Festival in which Chinese American older adults taught younger generations about Chinese characters, how they were created, and how they changed over time. The social engagement encouraged the older adult population to sign up for vaccines. The clinic actually ran out because they had an unexpected number of participants. Um, there have been local plays that were made accessible and free to people with disabilities on certain nights, uh, and then vaccines were available on site to encourage um, coming out and enjoying uh, a play, but also um, getting that information to keep them safe. Uh, many grantees are also focusing on health and using creative methods to provide vaccine clinics, including events that provide cookbooks where all materials can be found at the dollar store and the meals are healthier options than what uh, an individual might have at home. Typically, vaccines will be offered at the back of the room after discussing health and the importance of vaccinations, along with other decisions like diet and exercise. Another grantee works with local food banks to hand out uh, information at drive through events and provides a pull-off space for those who want more information about getting vaccinated. Some of the feedback we've received is that grantees are able to get a higher number of COVID vaccines administered when they don't mention COVID vaccines, specifically when promoting an event, which has been interesting. Um, unhoused homeless populations are also an area that our grantees are reaching out to heavily. This target population requires a lot of relationship building and trust and requires a provider that can come to them. One of my favorite stories from our grantees is when a group in Wisconsin used word of mouth and months of relationship building to vaccinate a group of um, unhoused individuals under the Holton Reservoir Bridge in Milwaukee. They had, not got, they had not gotten COVID vaccines because they were misinformed about the cost and were not educated on COVID-19 or the vaccine. Uh, they were able to share resources about housing and provide them with a cold Coca-Cola after their vaccine per their request. Um, these groups take time to access and build trust, but our collaborative is able to provide them with many resources along with vaccinations. There are so many stories from this work of how grantees are reaching those who would perhaps not be reached. They were perhaps not reached during the pandemic and may not have easy access um, to vaccines. Next slide. So what has this work shown us? I know Edwin had mentioned around 20% of our COVID vaccines administered are first time COVID shots. Um, we have one county in Florida where they're actually at 48% of the COVID vaccines are first time COVID vaccines. The reason we hear a lot are that people are scared to get the vaccine until they've heard from those they trust. And those trusted voices are many who got the vaccine themselves and are able to say they're, they're still safe and healthy. Taking the time to answer questions and explain away doubt makes a difference. Um, others felt that they had not had access to COVID the COVID vaccine, 
Again, some of these target populations are in rural areas and there's other factors that make it hard to reach if you're not looking for them. Our supportive services have provided opportunities for grantees to partner with local transportation providers, increasing ridership that hadn't completely bounced back from pre-pandemic times as well. Uh, creativity also abounds by using Uber, Lyft, and other transportation options to get people where they need to be to access information in a relaxed atmosphere to get their vaccinations. Education and outreach numbers continue to grow as we make those seven to eight touches on average to provide correct information and an opportunity for vaccinations. I'd also like to quickly mention that both U.S. Aging and the National Council on Aging are using a system called Cumulus to collect survey data for all individuals receiving vaccines. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a way to monitor and keep up to date on all the upcoming vaccine clinics, the real-time data um, on the things that are happening in the community, and grantees are also able to share their anecdotal stories photos and documents that go along with the event to allow us to have real time picture a real time picture of what the collaborative is doing from day to day. And with that, I'll just leave my information if anybody has any questions for me, but thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much. And our final presenter in this panel is Mary Beth Musumeci from George Washington University. Your slides are up. I see you on the zoom. You have the floor. You are still muted. Uh, I apologize. You, after this many years of the pandemic, one would think I could figure this out. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, it is quite a daunting position to be in, to be bringing up the rear um, uh, with such uh, amazing information that was shared. And I really enjoyed learning from everybody else's presentations. I will hopefully um, be supplementing and reiterating um, a lot of what my colleagues covered today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I am currently at the George Washington University School of Public Health. Prior to that, I was at the Kaiser Family Foundation, primarily focused on issues related to healthcare access um, and Medicaid for people with disabilities. And earlier in my career, I uh, was a practicing attorney um, at a protection and advocacy agency for people with disabilities doing healthcare access work as well. So I am drawing from all of those experiences um, to give you an overview of um, what state Medicaid agencies have been doing in terms of vaccine access and then uh, finishing up with some concrete examples from disability organizations um, to uh, supplement what others on the panel have already shared today. Next slide, please. Um, so um, as everybody um, is well aware, um, uh, the, much attention went to seniors in nursing homes, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so this slide is just a reminder of the disproportionate number of deaths um, that were experienced uh, by people living in long-term care facilities. Um, as others on the panel have mentioned, data about not only vaccination, but also COVID cases and deaths among people with disabilities living outside of nursing homes were largely incomplete, not standardized, and not always available. However, the uh, reports that uh, data and anecdotal reports that were available suggest that these populations also are um, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and therefore um, are an important area of focus. Next slide. So going back to the initial COVID vaccine rollout, federal policy really differed by setting at that time. And so um, people with disabilities are everywhere. Um, some are still in nursing homes, although since the um, Supreme Court's community integration decision in Olmstead back in 1999, we've seen more and more people with disabilities living in the community, um, living in uh, supported housing, in group homes, in their own homes, um, with services and supports to uh, facilitate their independent living, as well as living in intermediate care facilities for people with developmental disabilities. That's the ICF IDD um, abbreviation in the second column here. And so this um, slide is pulling from 
the uh, original federal rule that came out um, about vaccine um, reporting, education, and offering um, the vaccine to residents and staff. And so this was required in nursing homes. Um, the ICF IDDs had the education and offer requirement. And it's important to note here, some of these are larger facilities, um, but again, with the aftermath of Olmstead, we've seen um, more people moving to the community as well as smaller facilities. So an ICF IDD can be as small as four beds. Um, so these can be smaller as well. Um, and then we had elsewhere, really no standardized requirements for education and offering vaccine access to people in either inpatient behavioral health settings or living in the community. Um, and so this is just kind of echoing some of the access issues um, that Dr. Swainer in particular was highlighting in her presentation. Next slide, please. So where are, where can we find people with disabilities? Um, that is very often in the state Medicaid program um, because of shortcomings in private insurance, not being not designed to meet many of the needs of people with disabilities or um, other issues with access to private insurance. Um, uh, Medicaid continues to be a major source of coverage for people with disabilities, particularly it's often the only source of coverage for long-term care, either in um, institutions or in the community. And so from the initial vaccine rollout, this is from a survey that the Kaiser Family Foundation um, did back in 2021, um, asking state Medicaid agencies what they were doing. Um, and this was a general survey um, and what uh, states responded out of the 32 states responding, 22 of them said that they were focused on people who were receiving long term care in the community funded by Medicaid. Um, that's home and community based services. Um, so, from the very beginning, um, Medicaid agencies involved in outreach to that population, as well as people who were living in um, institutions other than nursing homes, um, such as assisted living facilities. Some specific examples that state shared um, was um, using data uh, to help public health agencies match um, where people were living with their vaccine registries to do outreach to people who hadn't yet been vaccinated. Um, doing outreach to Medicaid non-emergency medical transportation drivers. Um, this is a Medicaid covered benefit um, that provides access to appointments such as vaccines. So both um, outreaching to those drivers to get them vaccinated as well as encouraging them to drive to vaccination events. And then finally, encouraging um, Medicaid health plans to use community health workers to do outreach to people with disabilities in their plan. Next slide, please. Um, this is another survey um, from early 2021 that was focused solely on Medicaid, um, the part of Medicaid programs in states providing long-term care services in the community. Um, and all um, 30, uh, six states uh, that responded had a vaccine access policy in place. These ranged from partnering with public health agencies, non-emergency medical transportation, and engaging providers such as group home providers, um, job coaches, um, home health aides, personal care attendants in vaccine outreach. Um, at the time of this survey, um, just under half of the states that responded were tracking vaccination rates for their enrollees, um, using that data to inform outreach efforts. Um, so not very widespread tracking. And we had two states uh, report, Delaware and Indiana, that they were actually making that information publicly available to aid in outreach efforts. Um, another innovative uh, policy that I wanted to mention was Washington State added vaccine status to the functional assessment that it does for its enrollees. So when someone is um, newly requesting services or at, um, at least annually, your service plan will be reviewed and there are a number of questions that are asked. They had affirmatively added vaccine status um, to that list of questions in an effort to um, outreach and encourage uptake of vaccines. Next slide, please. Um, states also got um, enhanced funding uh, through the American Rescue Plan Act, particularly to support their Medicaid services um, for people living in the community with long-term care needs. Um, states um, had a lot of uh, 
discussion about how to use these funds, and there are a number of things states are doing, but I did want to highlight that a handful are choosing to focus on vaccine outreach um, and uptake um, in case that these some of these projects may be replicable elsewhere. So Indiana developed is developing and implementing an in-home vaccination program for its Medicaid um, long-term care enrollees in the community. Nevada is funding care coordinators to help people with appointments and using paramedicine providers to administer the vaccine to its enrollees. And finally, Texas is using some of the enhanced federal funds to provide pay time off for providers themselves to receive the vaccine. Next slide, please. So nevertheless, um, despite all of the efforts um, that not only state Medicaid agencies, but um, a wealth of other people, including um, the efforts that others on the panel have spoken about, have been engaged in for the last couple of years. Here we are in 2023, and we still have disparities in vaccine uptake. Um, so this is the most current um, CDC data from the Pulse Survey. Um, this is showing um, late March to early May 2023 and looking at vaccination status for COVID among adults with and without disabilities. And then you can see as the slide um, progresses, it breaks it down by type of disability, um, seeing, hearing, mobility, et cetera, with the most striking um, discrepancy being um, adults with or without communication disabilities. So over 84% of adults without a communication disability have received a COVID vaccine um, compared to less than 70% of those with a communication disability. So obviously still more work to be done and that ties back to all of the great um, targeted outreach efforts that others on the panel have been discussing. And I want to wrap up by highlighting a couple more examples along those lines. Next slide, please. So this is um, a screenshot from a protection and advocacy agency, Disability Rights Maryland. Um, the PNAs are federally funded. There's one in every state. Um, and their mission is to advocate for people with disabilities. And as um, the my ACAL um, colleague on the panel mentioned, um, they were involved in vaccinating vaccine outreach efforts. So Disability Rights Maryland um, has these really um, helpful um, resource, uh, or excuse me, frequently asked questions in really simple language. What steps do I go through to get the COVID shot? What are my rights? What kinds of help can I ask for? And how do I ask for the help that I need? Um, another um, more detailed part of this website is that they actually give plain language examples of things that people with disabilities may need. Um, this is um, helpful, obviously, for people who are thinking about access but um, for themselves, but also helpful for providers to give them an idea of things that, that might be um, useful or needed um, for people coming to the clinic. So, for example, before going for the shot, helping you set up the place and time, letting you come at a time when there aren't a lot of people and it's quieter, having someone help you uh, understand the paperwork. While you are at the clinic, accessible parking, um, wheelchair accessible bathrooms, letting you bring a support person, providing access to a sign language interpreter, um, providing um, access to information in other ways, such as braille or large prints or having someone read you the information. Um, et cetera. So really concrete examples that I think are very helpful. And then they also have what I've screenshotted on the right side of this slide is a plain language, one page form, how to ask for a reasonable accommodation for a vaccine. If people don't know um, how to ask for what they need, um, this is a, it provides you with a form to fill in. What do you need and why you need it? Um, so really helpful, concrete um, information that people can take with them. Next slide, please. This is a, another um, collaborative that uh, involved the Protection Advocacy Agency Disability Rights South Carolina, along with a, a number of other um, organizations in their network. And I have their um, website 
is has way too much uh, information on it to fit on one slide, but I screenshotted some of the key parts. So they have an access hotline. They also have frequently asked questions. They have these profiles of who they call vaccine champions um, of people with disabilities in the community talking about their vaccine experience and why it was important for them to get vaccinated. Um, and then resources, um, having people not only report issues with access, but also asking people to report their positive experiences that they um, had an accessible vaccine site and really detailed concrete information about options to get transformation, transportation to a vaccination appointment. Next slide, please. Um, and this um, is a poster that was done um, by folks at the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. And I want to acknowledge Holly Holmeister, who generously shared her time and expertise on this project. I've pulled out their um, findings on the next slide so that we can take a closer look at them. But I also wanted to include the poster because it just illustrates the breadth of different organizations that they were working with. Their model was really thinking about um, giving community partners the um, technical assistance and information that they needed to tailor vaccine outreach to the, a, the particular population that they were working with. So for example, one of the examples is the Spine Bifida um, Association was able to uh, talk to its members specifically about what um, should I get a vaccine if I have a latex allergy. So information that is tailored to the population that is coming directly from um, trusted community sources um, to help people get their questions answered. Next slide, please. So as I said, these are the promising practices that came out of that work. Um, one thing um, that I thought was worth mentioning is, is that in their outreach efforts, they were focused on the people with disabilities, but they also realized they could reach others, family members and direct service providers. These are people who are supporting people with disabilities and trusted messengers, and they were also able to include these people in getting vaccines if they also um, had not uh, been able to do that yet. Um, as has been mentioned, using trusted messengers, I explained um, that their um, model was really asking the messengers who they hope to reach and asking them to think about how those people get information and what motivates them in order to understand how to tailor their message. Um, delivering a simple, consistent message, as others have mentioned, and also, as others have mentioned, overcoming hesitancy really requires multiple individualized one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, creating accessible, sensory-friendly vaccination sites, ensuring transportation, um, in referring people to the dial line from ACL that has been mentioned, um, focusing on multiple vaccines for all ages, including the flu, not just COVID, and uh, collaborating with community resources and seasonal events, especially in this fall season. Um, so thank you very much, and I will turn it back over. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of the members of this panel. This has uh, really been a very important and instructive uh, panel for all of us. Just a, an anecdote for me to throw out. One of my colleagues and I work, uh, have a clinic uh, one day a week at a uh, educational facility for young adults with developmental disabilities. They've transitioned from the child world into the adult and building immunization processes into that clinic so that they're in a familiar setting, we make it a bit less threatening than coming into a healthcare center has, has really been a, a rewarding and helpful piece for, uh, for that population, for their families, and, and has really been helpful for us as providers also. Um, looks like Troy Knighton on the line wanted to have a question or, or raise a comment, Troy? Oh, hi. I, I was glad to see the comments on aging because I often felt like with my parents that they were at a disadvantage because they just weren't proficient and didn't understand the use of internet and websites. So we had to provide assistance for them to schedule their appointments for COVID vaccines and just other 
services online, even a s simple task as like paying a bill or scheduling a doctor's appointment. So um, I uh, had thought about aging as a disability during the first two talks, and then I realized that, oh, we are going to talk about this. So I was glad to see that on the um, in the program. So thank you for talking about age issues. And Mitch Rothholz also online had a comment. Uh, thank you, Bob, and, and thanks to all the panelists and thank uh, and back staff for putting this on the, the agenda. I hope this is just the start of looking at this issue. Uh, just for disclosure, um, I, I have a, a, an interest in this area because I have a son with Down syndrome and I'm involved in the Down syndrome community. And so there's been a lot of uh, discussions at, with the experience with COVID. So there are a couple of observations and points I just want to get on, on the record just so that we have some, some follow-up discussions at some point. One of the things that nobody touched on that, that the disability community also was concerned about, uh, at least in COVID, was that the clinical trials didn't really include individuals with disabilities to any great extent. And that was a concern by specifically the parents of individuals with disabilities um, regarding you know, this, these vaccines in individuals with disabilities. So it's something I think we need to have further discussion on how to include individuals with disabilities in those clinical trials so that people can see themselves in those trials and have some comfort level. Um, additionally, I think it's been touched on in some ways, but I think we need a concerted effort to really uh, provide training to providers, uh, just like the Autism Society has done, um, of really giving them the comfort level of working with individuals with disabilities and caregivers. Because as we all know, it does take a little more time and effort, but once you get that comfort level, it's not a, a great, great task. So I think that's something to look at from that. Uh, again, we also have to touch on it, and I think Troy mentioned it too, in terms of technology. And I, I'm, one of the things that we need to be aware of is, especially in some of the senior uh, population, is people are not technology savvy and they don't have smartphones. And we've got to be careful when we put things out and it's all um, technology based. Uh, we've got to be careful of, of that. And we, you know, after some experiences, we put in line phone uh, call access. But we have to be careful. And one of the good examples when the masks came out for availability free to the public. It was only information about it was was given to providers of just a QR code. Well, people don't have QR you know code phones and and access to that. So we need to be careful what we put out, how we put it out, so it's accessible to everybody. Um, the other challenge too, um, as we do these community clinics now, uh, where vaccine is not being provided by the government, uh, that's going to be a, an issue in some of these these cases. So we need to to um, have processes in place that makes it simplified. And what providers are going to have to be doing or starting to do is trying to get information before they go to some of these, these community clinics so that they can check on, on coverage uh, before they get there so people don't get uh, turned away because they don't have coverage um, if it's not under one of those programs where they have to provide it if they can pay or not pay. Not everybody is a bridge program provider for, for COVID, for example. Um, so we need to, to look at the system of implementation, as I talked about yesterday as well. Um, we also need to look at, and this is something that NBAC, I think, needs to look at overall, is what Medicaid programs are paying uh, for providing these services. And, and the cost of providing some of these services, especially if you have to take more time with individual patients, um, what, what is being reimbursed? Um, because whether it's a VFC program for children or some of these um, aging programs that are, are covered by Medicaid, uh, we need to look at what providers are, are getting to, to give them the incentive to to be willing to go out, uh, I, I'd say out of their way, but be willing to provide these services to this, this population. And then we need to look at some uh, public health departments. Uh, we're looking at uh, doing some pre preemptive uh, planning uh, in terms of looking at the, the needs in their, of individuals in their community who have disabilities. So, so giving funding to the public health to do some of that pre-planning. Um, and I think some, some um, agencies have done that be good to take a look at who's done that and um, see how it's gone. And then lastly, um, Mary Beth, your, your data was really interesting. And one of the things if you have would be interesting to, to know is um, when you looked at the COVID vaccine coverage of the different types of disabilities, um, it said one or more. If there's a way of looking at how many of those individuals got more than one uh, COVID vaccine uh, would be of interest, I think, because 
did they get the first one, but then their experiences were not as not that great, or it was such a challenge to get there that they didn't get come back for the for other vaccines. So be interesting to see that analysis. But again, thank you all for sharing this information and for having this a topic of discussion. I'll give the panelists a chance to, to respond if anybody would like to. Please. Yeah, uh, thank you for those comments. This is uh, Bonnie Sweenor. I wanted to, to address the important issue, thank you for raising, about the exclusion of people with disabilities from, from trials in general, in particular yeah. vaccine trials. Um, this is an issue I've actually written about with my colleagues. We published a commentary in New England Journal about a year ago. So, you know, not to get too in the weeds on science policy, but the exclusion of people with disabilities from trials is largely driven by um, what I alluded to when I spoke, is the fact that people with disabilities are not formally designated as a health disparity population. This actually is a current uh, con conversation. That designation is given by the director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities in consult with the director of HRQ. Um, at the end of last year, I co-chaired a committee advising the NIH um, around some recommendations to support uh, disability inclusion, and that was one of our main recommendations. It was taken up under consideration by an advisory committee under NIMHD. They rejected the designation, which is unfortunate. So that's not a final say. Um, the director still has latitude to accept or reject that rejection of the advisory council, but that designation really is key because what that signals is then data collection and opportunities to be included, people with disabilities to be included in diversifying efforts or efforts to diversify research and clinical trial enrollment. And so that really is sort of a, a programmatic or policy barrier that I don't think is widely understood. Um, there's lots of other barriers, bias and data collection, but that really is a, is, has been a profound barrier. Um, I also just want to make a quick comment on, on the great data uh, Mary Beth showed from the, the, the Household Pulse survey uh, to, to illustrate the impact of the gaps in data. It really is profound, you know, the, the difference in vaccine uh, uptake for people with disabilities. But I also want to say that it took a year for that survey to include dis disability data and grassroots advocacy of myself and many others in the community. And that was really a problem, right? It took us to have many, many conversations and, and emails and uh, push to even collect disability data in that survey for us to be able to look at data like that. It was over a year into the pandemic before we could do so. so just as a very concrete example of some of the missed opportunities when we're not collecting that data. But thank you for all of those comments. Um, I think they're, they're all just spot on, so thank you. Mary Beth, you also want to make a comment? Um, yes, yeah, so, and thank you, Bonnie. Just to, to um, amplify and add on to what Bonnie was just saying, um, I wanted to respond to the um, comment about the Pulse data. So it was a rapid response survey. The questions um, sometimes changed from version to version, uh, but the link on the slide will get you to what they did ask. Um, so basically there's three questions that they have data uh, available on. So it was the one or more doses of vaccine. Um, did you receive the bivalent booster? And what were your reasons if you didn't receive the booster? What were your reasons for that? Um, so um, it's you know, useful to have this information available, but um, as Bonnie was just saying, you know, it is illustrating that even at this point, the limits of the information that's available. So I don't know that they dug into, um, if they broke out that one or more doses question, it, from my quick look at the site, it doesn't appear that they did. Chris Arisman. Thank you. And thank you for um, your presentations. They were uh, really inspiring and educational. Um, I had my question or comments are really for Dr. Swainer. Um, I was very interested in um, your discussion about collecting data on disability status. In Minnesota, um, we did have, I think, a fairly robust um, 
inclusion of our disability community um, in some of our work. Um, it was included in our health disparities group. However, uh, despite that, it was insufficient. And um, some of the challenges that we faced is that we really didn't have any denominator data. And when we looked into it, um, we really struggled with how we were going to collect it. And obviously, if it, if it becomes included as part of an EHR, that would um, become a baseline. But my, my kind of two-part question is, one, you know, what recommendations do you have for health departments who are really interested in um, doing a better job of, of collecting that data? And then second, um, one of the challenges we faced early on was obviously the um, limited supply of vaccine and how, how to prioritize um, within populations. And so um, to your point, when one in four people does fall into the disability category, are there also good ways to look at subsets? Um, to, to Mitch's comment um, referring to uh, the Down syndrome community, that was one group that, man, we knew the exact numbers and, and we got really good information from. But at any rate, so thanks for the, the concept. How can health departments do a better job of collecting data? And then the question about stratifying if we had to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question and, and for the work uh, within, within your state. It's a really good question. So um, as for collecting disability data, actually HHS has a recommended set of uh, standard six, six questions that are used currently in the, in the census. Um, those were what was pushed forward under the recommendations for EHR and ONC. So just as a quick back, background, there's really two sets um, of recognized uh, questions to assess disability status. One is we refer to as the ACS set, the American Community Survey, which is what HHS uses. The other is called the Washington Group. They're very similar. They're both six questions, to not, which makes it confusing, but not exact. Um, I support the ACS questions. There's some discourse in the community. But what we actually pushed forward in, in the EHR was the ACS questions, six plus one question that isn't present that is on the Washington Group question on communication disabilities because it really is so important and there's data showing lots of, um, well, I think Mary Beth uh, made that point with, with the data on vaccines for people with communication disabilities. I will uplift Oregon, which is really doing a phenomenal job as a state in collecting disability data. So they're doing the same thing. They're collecting the ACS 6 plus communication question Plus, they have a module with a few other additional questions because there's still groups not covered. Now, I know that feels like a lot of questions, and there's ways to think about collecting that as one question, select all, and there's things to, to field test. So all that is to say is there's options out there, right? There's standardized options. You know, I think there's a need to focus and think about interoperability, right, standardization across systems so we can look at and link data sets. Um, so then your second question about stratifying and, and sort of uh, what we do in times of scarce resources, right? So I think it's imperative to, to realize, and, and you elevated this, we had data on um, um, certain groups of the disability community, and largely it's because they were enumerated by ICD codes in EHR, right? That's, that's the reality of it. Um, not everyone with disabilities, certain disability types are very poorly captured. People who are blind, people who are deaf, for example, um, and many other disability categories. They're not well captured by ICD code, so you would need other data. Um, I'll also just say that the gold standard for disability is self-report, not to have someone make that decision. It's really moving in the community as a identity. It's a social construct like race, ethnicity. So. I think it is a challenging thing to do until you have the data, is my answer, right? And so that, that part of, I think, the tension of what was felt was, was well, twofold. One, is we didn't have the data, and so we're making uninformed decisions. We often think about the bias in the data we have, but we don't think enough about the bias driven by the data we don't have, and to me, this was a case of that. But additionally, I think what the disability community was, was outraged by was just the acceptance that people with disabilities have a lower quality of life and have lower value to society. 
not ableism. People with disabilities don't feel that way. Some of our measures like qualities and dollies are built on ableist ideas to perpetuate that concept. And in fact, the 504 regs uh, tightening that, that Secretary Becerra just rolled out are, are striking against those ideas. So I'm not sure I give you a direct answer, except better data, use some standardized approaches, and I would suggest looking to Oregon. They're doing a great job. So we're pushing time just a bit, but I, I want to uh, allow Jewel and Melody to bring their uh, questions or comments forward also. Jewel, please. Thank you. Thanks for all the presentations. Even if you don't have an answer now, perhaps you can get back to us. Um, and back has an um, innovation and immunization subcommittee, which right now is um, looking at the whole ecosystem um, one of the things I wondered about as we think about how to increase the uptake of the way shots are given right now is whether or not, even in this breadth of um, and range of disabilities, there might be innovations that you are thinking about or that people who are out in the field are saying, wow, if we could only do it this way with, with regard to delivery systems, for example. And once again, it doesn't have to, unless you just have something that you already say, why don't they make it like this instead? It might be something else that we would want to factor into our report. So maybe think about that a bit and, and certainly shoot us a note and we'll we'll get that back to our subcommittee. I'll, I just, I just yeah. want, I'm sorry, Capital. Yeah. I, I just want to quickly say, I'm sure my, my the panelists have lots of things to respond. Meet people where they are, go to their homes, I think that was a, a very clear call from people with disabilities and older adults. And Melody Butler, you get the last word. Thank you very much for the presentations. I really enjoyed, especially you bringing to light the visual impairment um, in that particular uh, subset community with people with disabilities. Um, during the community educational efforts, did the members of the panel find that members and caregivers in the various communities of disability are more susceptible to misinformation? What were some of the interventions that overcome these obstacles, and are there current efforts to protect them from future ne negative campaigns and influence? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's, um, a, that's a bomb. <laughs> yeah. it, was a it was a huge problem. Um, and we saw it in different geographic areas of the country. Um, and I think you could sort of deduce that from the statistic that Sarah provided where 28% of folks in Florida, in, from our grantee in Florida, it was their first time getting any vaccine. And it's... We hear all kinds of types of misinformation, and it's a battle that we just have to continue to wage with accurate information getting to the, the lowest, the, 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 the local level and into different cultures. And um, I wish we had had time to show you the Wrestling Association one. It was a population, they just were opposed. They were just, it, it, they just weren't even thinking about it. And it wasn't until our folks developed a partnership with them and went to wrestling matches and had their booth and the opportunity and provided information that it was like, oh, they must be one of us. They're okay. And that's what caused folks to trust us and uh, permitted them to make the decision to get vaccinated. So. I have one closing remark. I just want to thank all of you and all of the commenters for the confirming and the advisory comments. We believe that we cannot, in fact, we know we can't be effective if we don't first hear and then adhere from, to the, the, these comments from all stakeholders and all of the experiences that you have. So we want to hear you. We want to continue to collaborate with you. Thank you very much. Certainly want to thank all the members of this panel. This, is, this has been a great session. Uh, we're going to, to now uh, close this panel. We're going to go to break until 10.45 uh, Eastern Time. Thank you for participating in our September NBAC meeting. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.